Hello. I'm the gong that will start the sound at the beginning of the, every lecture for two weeks. <laughs> I think Dan told you something that uh, I will put on a spin on something. Something like that. I'll put a spin on some story. OK, I think he meant this. <laughs> so just look at my hand, and I'm trying to rotate my arm by 2 pi. And it become like this. That's about 2 pi. <laughs> and then you can continue to do it for another 2 pi. Oh, it comes back. <laughs> so today we're going to start study such an object. OK, so I guess according to Dan's idea of like, putting a spin on something, we're going to study the quantum field zero in part two called a spin not equal zero. OK, I think the motivation is very clear. So I'll give you a very brief motivation. If you just look around us, and if you want, you can look, look into the universe. But everything is made with electron, nucleon, photons. And it's a minute dose of other things. OK, dark matter is a big dose, but we don't know much about it. And possibly it's described by quantum field theory. So it's still interesting to study quantum field theory. But at least, but anyway, while we're part, we'll focus on the electrons and the photon. And uh, so there is really only one scalar particle that we have discovered, which is the Higgs. But for generations, generations of physicists study the scalar fields. Why? They are the one need the motivation. That's why Dan gave you much, much longer motivation. Because they really need a reason to. Well, sometimes, you know, as a physicist, you study because you can. <laughs> it's something simple. OK, relatively simple. As you guys are working on dance homework, you might disagree with me on that. <laughs> But there's only one component of a scalar, and they transform trivially under Lorentz transformation as all the 20-ish people that I have read about the homework one, which is good. And uh, on the other hand, we're going to study the constituents <laughs> of the word, the reality ourselves, and um, about these important real particles. and. Uh, very often, we'll look back to the past two weeks. And hopefully, we'll learn some lessons from it. And that hopefully will make things a little bit easier. OK, so, so I guess we should have an outline of the course. The outline looks very similar to the title. So we'll spend about three lectures. I can't estimate how it goes until, you know, it goes. About three lectures to study, let's say, at a spin one half. It's just, it's quantized, and that's the next level. It's a natural thing to study. And it was study the equation of motion, why not? And then, of course, after we have an equation, we should solve it. So we should study the solutions of it. And actually, we have some you know, simpler version of solutions, as we will see tomorrow, various kinds of solutions. And then we'll try to write down the Lagrangian of it, because we have spent two weeks to learn if you have a Lagrangian, you have an interaction term, how do you study physical things such as cross-sections. So we need a Lagrangian. Only having equation of motion is not enough. And actually, we'll go a little bit further. We'll see what kind of a Lagrangian with this spin one half things are allowed. We'll make the complete list. So if we ever want some interactions, we just couple it with other fields. Something like that. OK. So next, of course, we're going to quantize this thing. Of this spin equals one half thing. And then the next will go up. Another one says, well, but we're already familiar spin equals 1, which is the Maxwell theory. And if you somehow it's a little distant, don't worry, you'll get a homework, to get a review on it. So, but then we'll skip the whole part of studying all this 
things without a quantizing, we're just directly going to quantize it. Actually, you've already seen the quantization of spin equals one, two, that you have seen the Coulomb gauge, but we are the relativist people. So we really want to quantize in a way that is covariant. There, there, there is a perk. The perk is we can maximally profit from what we learned in the last two weeks. Then, of course, there's always caveats and the price you have to pay. And we'll see about that. And then in the last lecture, of course, everything should interact with the other. So we're going to make these things, spin equals one half, for example, electron, to interact with spin equals one, for example, photon. Then they will interact. And then this is the famous quantum electrodynamics. It's like the electrodynamics, but it's quantized. And often they just brief this thing as QED because you write it often enough. OK. So before we start, it's just a couple of things. It's like a convention thing. That uh, it's the same convention with Dan. I tried my best that uh, we follow the same notation and uh, stuff. But it's good to get this straight because people use different conventions. Well, the physical result should be all the same. Okay, so we're still in the most minus convention. Such it, it, it has a perk. Then you can just write to the energy relationship like this. And then we are still in h bar equals c equals 1. I think we're in the g equals 0 convention because we have no gravity whatsoever. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, we also use Einstein convention. Pairs of indices means the sum, unless otherwise stated. If there's other things come up, we'll mention them. OK. So let's get us started. So I'm going to tell you that for the first three lectures, we're going to study spinners that describe spin one half fermions. And then at this point, you should really stop me. You were like, what are spinners? How do we know they are spin one half? How do we know they are fermions? I just like to speak one sentence with three things that should be questioned. I'll tell you the answer to the first question. The spinner is the solution of a Dirac equation. And now you'll be like, what's Dirac equation? So I didn't really answer anything yet. I gave a definition. And we'll spend roughly half the lecture to define this thing. Well, actually, a little bit, my estimate is two thirds of the class to define what is a spinner. But first, let's find the equation. OK, we'll take a historical route. In history, apparently when Dirac was trying to find his equation, he was staring into a fire. And suddenly, that's very inspiring. And something hit his head, and it's like the bubble with the light. I got this, his equation. But let's go a little further back. We'll go back to 1925. So Schrodinger has this awesome idea, says that I should replace the energy with the operator I partial partial T, the momentum with minus I gradient. Yeah, this should be familiar to you. And then he write down says, I don't care about the relativity. It wasn't discovered that long. And without relativity, the word and function just fine for a few hundred years. So he says, let me do this. And I get an operator equation. I'm going to act it on some wave function. And I get. that Schrodinger equation. 
And the Schrodinger equation has a probabilistic interpretation, says if I have the density, Schrodinger psi star psi, then it's positive definite, so I can use this to describe what's the probability of finding a particle somewhere. Yeah? The story is clear? And then, of course, we just want to include a special relativity. The only thing we want to change is from that guy, we change to partial mu, partial nu, which is just defined by pp square equals m square. And then, we make the replacement that p downstair mu is i partial partial x mu, which is just going to be abbreviated as this. And then if you make the substitution, you get something like i partial upstairs, i partial downstairs. Let's make it acting on something acting on the same thing. And then that gives you a minus one, you move on the other side. You get a Klein-Gordon equation. Huh? Okay. I hope I'm not going fast, because there's something you haven't already known. And thanks to everybody who has submitted homework, that we can, I, I'll just directly write down the Klein-Gordon density, which is, I'll take the zero component because I'm looking for a density. Okay, so as you all argued in your homework, that we want to just take a phi star phi, but that's not going to work because we have to respect the special relativity. If we want to have a conservation law, the density that the respect to special relativity had better to be a time component of a current, which is a zero component of this four vector, which you have already seen from the first two weeks that look like this. Okay, so this is just the only candidate. I want the density, that's the density. There's no argument about it. And now, the thing we want to do is that, well, let's take, so after you have been through the first week, you know that whenever you have something you want to solve, it's always the Fleming expansion. So it's always going to be a plane wave of some sort. So, Let's just take a look at a solution that is proportional to a plane wave, see what happens. So, so what do you think happens if I take such a plane wave and plug in the energy density? I mean, the, sorry, the density that I wanted to call it the probability density. So you have the derivative respect to t, which is just giving you i k zero. Then the other part just cancels. It's e to the i k x and e to the minus i k x. And the other term will give you the same thing. So this thing gave you minus two k zero. Oh, here's a problem. If I have a solution with k0 bigger than 0, I have some density, which I want to call it a probability density, which is negative. OK, as you have learned in the last two weeks, it's not necessarily a problem. You can interpret it a different way. You just have to abandon the fact that this is a wave function. Well, Dirac doesn't know that. He's staring into the fire, and he's deeply troubled by this thing called a negative probability density, he says, no, I'm going to write an equation that has not a, this problem. So what do you think, which part of the density change make the difference, make this negativeness shows up? 
It's a question. <laughs> In case you didn't notice my tone. Since I can't speak a question mark. Oh, I, I can actually, I, actually, I can say question mark. So if you look at the two density, which part do you think this make that density has a chance to be negative? Question mark. <laughs> Minus actually this part will just give exactly the same thing as this part. So for the purpose, we can ignore the second half. What do you think? If you look at this and this, what's the difference? The I. There's I and then what else there is? There's a time derivative. No, we can't take time derivative. If you have a thing and now you decide to take some derivative, then of course it become not positive definite. Okay. Well, if you trace back, what do you think it's the difference between the, the original equation? Still a question. <laughs> if you look at the Schrodinger equation and the Klein Gordon equation, what's the difference? Time derivative. There are two time derivatives. <laughs> so what Dirac wants? Dirac wants is one time derivative. Okay, very good. He also wants a special relativity because the non special relativity thing is already done. Schrodinger nailed it. Okay, so if I want one time derivative, what do you think the next line I should be writing down? What does special relativity do? <coughs> it says time is not a fixed quantity. Space is not a fixed quantity. Some of you even said in your answer says they are mixed up. So if I want something that respect special relativity at a better treat time and a space equally which means, what's his second requirement of his equation? It says he wants one time derivative. Right. One, one space derivative. One space derivative. <laughs> exactly. Ah. Then, then he says, well, I have a third requirement. He was like, can Gordon start with that uh, special relativity? energy momentum relationship. I want that too, hmm? to respect to special relativity. I mean, his, his goal never changed. He wants to write down something that has a special relativity and quantum mechanics together. So he says, I also want this. Well, in other words, he also wants this, but this definitely does not fit the bill. This is a klein garden app operator. Okay, this is direct choice of, oh, historically it's chosen to be Poseidon. See, we are very important. You are very important. <coughs> anyway, so, so, but this is not a one time derivative and one space derivative. If only I could just take a square root of this. Oh, all problems solved. We'll have one time derivative and one space derivative. And I'll just square it back to get my energy momentum relationship. And that's a brilliant idea, isn't it? Except that thing, that thing is not easy to take square root unless we understand it as a complex equation. See, so if I have... Okay, this might be, okay, I'll write it in a way that you definitely recognize. <laughs> huh. This can consider to be taking the complex square root of a square plus b square. I mean, we're, we're not going to get a real square root out of this. So we'll just go a little further, which is not that but considering the partial derivative is always associated with i to be interpreted the, by, as the momentum anyway, 
So it's not that a good crazy idea to think of this, this term as this term that we can associate as a mild with. Yeah? So after combining all these thoughts, Dirac says, I want some i, some partial derivative. This one really doesn't matter, because if I add a minus sign, it still works. So I want this. This is my square root. But there is a problem, isn't it? I do need some linear coefficient. Yeah? Historically, it's called gamma. Don't ask me why. It's just history. That Dirac write this stuff and I claim this is the Dirac equation. Well, let's just quickly check that indeed it is a square root of Klein Garden operator. So what do we want to check is this thing multiplied by its complex conjugate. Let me change the letter. Yeah? Okay. And then the last term is good. It's just plus m squared. And you can see the cross term, it's exactly the same except off by a minus sign, which is good because I want them to cancel. And the first term gave you something like gamma nu, gamma mu, partial nu, partial mu. Okay? Now if we compare with the Klein Garden operator, we just want this guy to be equals to partial square. In order to make some comparison, I'll write it this way. Yeah? I'm not going too fast. Dirac, according to his first two requirements, wrote down something with a linear in time and space derivative thing, operator thing. And then he says, let's check that my solution is still a solution of Klein-Gordon equation. And from that, he gets this thing. So the next step to do is realize this thing is symmetric. I'm sure that uh, almost all of you get to be tortured about the symmetry of things in the relativity interview. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure you know <laughs> what to do now. Is that this is symmetri symmetric and a better replace this guy by its symmetric part because that's the only part that's going to survive. I'll symmetrize this thing and now I can equate. So we realize, okay, not all linear combination is going to work which is, of course, true. And we will also define a curly bracketed notation for this thing called the anti-commutator, which is just change a minus sign to plus sign. So this is the anti-commutator. If you multiply and switch and add together, it's just going to show up a lot more often in the future. So we'll have a notation. Then I could have used the new notation, says that this gamma things, the linear coefficient should be satisfied this thing, which is called a Dirac algebra. So, so Dirac followed his vision, write down a first derivative in everything equation, demand his solution still obeys Klein-Gordon equation, and I realize there's some things needs to be some constraints on his linear coefficients. Okay. Yeah. Any questions up to now? Yeah. So I have one question. Yeah. Which is when you are taking the square root of a derivative. Yeah. You are also you are also 
violating the locality principle, right? Because derivative, square root of a derivative, if you expand it as a tether series, you will have infinite number of derivatives. Which uh -huh. you don't have a local action. Well, it's more, this is just a way of saying it. It's really squaring this should give you that. So you, when you square things, you don't violate the locality. Okay. Hey, that's just a, okay. It's, that, 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 that's just a way to remember how Dirac equation is derived. But what is the correct way to say is that this operator squares to client garden operator. Yep. Don't you generally want to dagger the gamma if you're taking a complex conjugate of the equation? So you'd have gamma, gamma. Ah. Good question. And uh, it will... I guess, I guess we're like, we explicitly put the I on the, on the D mu to have it be Hermitian. I guess we want gamma to be real. No, gamma is not real. Right. Gamma is not real. Okay. So yeah, this is a very good question. Well, I guess the idea is that, okay, so maybe, maybe we shouldn't say, okay, you're very right. Maybe we just shouldn't say it's a really square root in quotation mark that we really shouldn't say it's the square of the operator because as long as you can find any operator acting on this, then you can say Psi is a solution for klein Gordon equation. Like the, the, whatever acting on this guy doesn't matter. Also, uh, maybe in the history way, you would say that let's envision gamma to be real and I try to do this. And then, then when you come back, to, then you realize, OK, gamma is actually not a real, real crap. But then you realize it doesn't matter. What matters is you have a Dirac equation that is annihilated by some operator that combines to give the klein order operator. OK, thank you. Thank you. So it's really not much a square root. OK, let's put it in periods of quotation mark to be very quotation mark. OK, yeah, you're right. But uh, that doesn't invalidate our argument. As long as you find some operator, and this operator we found just happened to be look like the complex country. But it's not. OK, so now I have a question. So if we stare at this thing, how many degrees of freedom on the right? I feel I ask this at least 15 times in the interview week. But I'll ask again, how many degrees of freedom does this ha have on the right-hand side? In four dimensions, let's stick with four dimensions. We have a metric. How many components? Good, just yield at me, 10. So let's say, suppose these are ordinary numbers. How many variables are we looking for? If gamma is just ordinary linear coefficient as we hoped, how many degrees freedom we have? It has four. OK, we have 10 equations and looking for four things. It's not going to work. Even if they're complex, we're looking for like eight things. So we know that these are definitely not numbers. And as you guys are so familiar with linear algebra, you would know that we will end up calling gamma matrices. But let's leave it for now, because now I must have made a confession that I have lied. This is not how Dirac wrote down his equation. So what the Dirac did is that he really wants to write down something analogous to Schrodinger equation. So what he writes is this. Oh, maybe that's why he chose Psi. It even looks similar. And what he writes is this. And he called this the Hamiltonian operator. And it makes sense. So let's see what the Dirac's equation looks like. This will give us some insights, further insights on this gamma. OK, so what Dirac says is very funny, isn't it, Dirac? You want a special relativity equation. But now you decide to break 
like it actually explained it right, explicitly write everything out. Very interesting, but let's follow you. So I'm just writing the time and the space derivative component as the Dirac told me to. Oh, missing a term. Missing a term. All right? And the next thing I do is I move everything else to the right. Okay. So now do what I do. So this is our equation. Okay. Since Dirac equation is so important, I shall write it again. So this is our starting point. I want to, and we want it to look like that. Yep. Um, is it, what, sorry, why isn't it minus i, gamma i, di? Oh, I'm just moving this to the right. And moving this term to the right, too. But aren't you using the plus, minus, minus, minus? Yeah, but I'm stu I didn't. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. For convenience, I never try to specify, like, it's still just, if it's summing upstairs and downstairs, I don't have to worry about the metric. I'll use this trick later so I don't have to worry about the minus. So, what do we do now? If you compare this with this, we're off by a gamma zero. How do I get rid of it? Multiply by gamma zero, yes. Multiply by gamma zero because look at this cute thing. Or wherever we got it, it says gamma zero squared equals one. So I can just multiply by gamma zero, which gives me whatever it, it Multiply gamma zero gives me. And this is what he calls the Hamiltonian operator, which makes sense. It'll come back later that indeed you will say that our Hamiltonian indeed look like this. But that will be after we introduce Lagrange. But now, as I said, do this little calculation, we want to get some insights on gamma zero. If it's a Hamiltonian operator, it means, what can you tell me about a Hamiltonian operator? Question mark. Yeah? What, what is, huh? Be Hermitian. It's Hermitian because it's operate, it's the observable. Excellent. So we know this thing. Well, both terms should be separately Hermitian. Let's look at the simple term. This term just have gamma zero. <coughs> so we immediately get is gamma zero is Hermitian. And then if we look at this term, I'm going to use a trick that you should all know, is that whenever I say i times partial derivative, I see it as a momentum. Since it's, op since it's observable, it's a Hermitian, so I didn't see it. The only thing I see in that term that it has questionable things is this term, yeah? So from the second term, immediately give us gamma zero is Hermitian. From the first term, I saw a momentum operator immediately throw it away because it's formation. And the only thing left is this guy. Well, let's just calculate this guy. This guy is that times gamma zero. And we can use our cute gamma zero trick. Says that the gamma dagger must equal this. And we can even use more of our gamma zero trick. Says. 1 gamma 0, 2 gamma 3 gamma 0. Well, OK, every pair doesn't count. So I can write it like that. Now they look covariant. Well, we ca I can't really say that because they are a bunch of numbers. They're just labeled this way. But I find out how to take Hermitian conjugate of gamma matrix. As you might have imagined, in the later on, we're probably taking a lot of inner product of things. 
take care of information, knowing how to dagger the gamma matrix is a good skill. So, so much we learned about the gamma matrix is that they satisfy the Dirac algebra. And then, if you want your Hamiltonian to be Hermitian, the gamma matrix satisfy that Hermitian identity. OK, so, well, Dirac write right on his equation. Then he's facing another puzzle. Again, you know, with all the wisdom about solving things, he also wants to look at a plane wave. Plane wave is back. OK, there's something in the middle there, which is quite a thing. So we'll just leave it like that. And uh, I think by the end of the second lecture, we'll have a sneak peek of what stands in front of the plane wave, and which is causing a lot of trouble compared to the scalar case. Because the scalar, you just write a linear coefficient. But we just figure out they can't be just linear coefficient. OK, but uh, we'll, we'll worry about it later. But we claim that they can still be expandable in this uh, wave. And he decided to take his energy off this plane wave. And he get i times i k0. Ha, ah, minus i. Uh-oh. That's not good. The, 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 well, in some sense, well, in one sense, our Word is not stable that we can just go down and deep down, <laughs> down to the, the energy is not a bounded below, and we can just, just drop our energy down. There's no ground state and just go, keep going. But if we ignore that problem, this is pretty good. It tells you if you just produce this psi particle and you gain energy, actually, this is like a, the ultimate perpetual machines. But no, this is not good because it will destroy our world first. And then, you know, Dirac is a genius. He says, my equation has a problem, but I'm going to propose this ingenious solution. I say the universe, I say that I'm writing an equation for electrons. No idea why. We'll spend like, like, lots of lectures to show this Psi thing is qualified to describe electron, namely that it's spin one half, it's a fermion, and it has charge. <laughs> he doesn't know that, he just like, hmm. This is the equation I'm writing now. And it's also like, it's not like I have a telepathy power to tell you that's, that's what he wants. Because his title of the paper is Quantum Theory of Electrons. <laughs> so that's clear what's in his mind. He was like, hey, electrons has poly exclusion principle. Let me just assume that all the negative energy of the entire universe is filled up. There is only positive energy available to us, problem solved. And then he has an even more genius idea. He just realized, OK, so, but these electrons that are filling his Dirac C of negative electrons, the negative energy the electrons, if one of them get some energy, which is possible, absorb a photon, something like that, and he jump out of C, it will leave a hole behind. And Dirac realized this hole will behave anyway just like electron. You know, always except it will have a negative charge, which he says electron must have an antiparticle, which we call it a positron. And then this is like the most successful theoretical prediction ever. Two years later, positron was discovered in the chambers. It's pretty amazing. We'll definitely come back to talk about antiparticles in the future of our lectures. So, but from now on, our history review is done. That uh, we'll move on 
to study. From now on, we'll always refer this thing as a Dirac field. Field. I just want to tell the story, write down the equation, find some gamma matrix identity, and then now we'll only refer them as a Dirac field. Okay, I guess Dan says he has a tradition of a break. But uh, do you guys feel you need a break? Oh, we can just keep going. Okay, how about that? The, the, today is the first day, it's a Monday. Monday you have a bonus. First I'll tell you a story. <laughs> and then you can have a break. Now we can come back to resume to do a, okay, slightly longer, maybe four line derivation. Okay, so this story is actually Tiberius. It, it's a good story. It says that um, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, and the Bohr, they go fishing. And then at the night, they, find, they get some fish and they, they camped. And then there's thunderstorm. And the Schrodinger wakes up first. And he wants to derive, divide the fish in equally three parts. But he realized it's not possible unless he throw away a fish. That's what he do. He throw a fish back to the waters and derive, divide the rest of the fish in three parts. And then he took one part as his own and he left. And now an hour later, Heisenberg wake up, has no idea that the Schrodinger has already gone. And then he will be like, okay, I'll just divide the fish in three parts. Guess what? He finds that he has an extra fish. Guess what? Great minds think alike. He throw that fish away, divide the rest of the fish in three parts, take his far part, and he went back. And you know, Bohr wakes up. So we're all physicists. Oh, okay, if we are mathematicians, <laughs> no, we're physicists. So we don't consider exceptions. It works for n equals one, n equals two. <laughs> so you know what Bohr did. He did exactly the same thing. And the next day, he, real he realized they all have equal amount of fish. Now here's the question. Where are they fishing? Question mark. Okay, we'll take a five minute sharp break and we'll resume. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm gonna start. Has anybody think about which, where they, are they fishing? I see, do I see? <laughs> So if you work out the problem, then it seems that the only way it's going to work is they each have a negative one fish. <laughs> so apparently there's only one place ever that they can achieve that. Okay. So welcome back. We have the Dirac equation. Oh, let me write down this. Why do I just like to write down the Dirac equation again and again? No way. All right. So actually, we should think about this a little hard. So we tried our best to respect special relativity by treating the time and the space in equal base, make sure the energy momentum relation is obeyed. And we really have another really important thing we really should check, which is, What else do we have to require this equation? The density is positive. The, the problem that you started with, the density is positive. That's a good question. The, the density is actually positive at the Dirac's level because it's Poseidon, Dagger Poseidon, just as the other case. We'll come back to that problem later. That's very good. Dirac achieved his goal. The density is positive, there's some negative energy issue, but he solved that by proposing antiparticles they are discovered. <laughs> happy, happy ending. But if we really want to say this equation is compatible with Lorentz symmetry, what else we need to check? Yeah? Okay, you're going further. You have about three lectures further. <laughs> so suppose Poseidon change in some way. 
So, so for example, our Mary Lee says, "Hey, Poseidon doesn't change Dan Lawrence transformation. Is there a problem?" Under Lorentz transformation, if psi does not change, do, you, do we have a problem with this equation? What are, what's the problem? People are nodding. <laughs> what's the problem? You look at it each, okay, okay, maybe sometimes notation is not helping. So do we have any problem now? If we stare at this equation, and then say, I do a Lorentz transformation, and I propose Poseidon does not change. Is there a problem? Does the mass term change? No. <laughs> does the connected term change? Yes, OK. That's not a good, right? We, what, we, what I'm trying to say is we want to require the covariance of the Dirac equation. Okay, we tried hard to respect the special relativity, but we never really check. Does it really respect special relativity? Okay, in other words, okay, maybe you will see the relation later. In other words, before we dig into all this, oh, I have matrices, we should work out what are these matrices, and work out how to multiply them together, do some commutator, there's lots of things you can do with those gamma matrices. But before we dig into that, like a really tedious business, we should ask ourselves some philosophical question. Like, what is this per se? Well, you might tell me that a Psi is a program to bring very intelligent young people into this Waterloo place and get them trapped here to do a boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> but my question really is, what is Psi? For example, one thing you can tell us, tell me what is Psi is, how does it transform under the Lorentz group? Well, as we just argued, it better transform. Because at this point, the mass term transform, the connect term doesn't. So we established Psi prime at x prime cannot equals to Psi. And I'm going to postulate it's some linear combination of Psi. OK, so because we already established the gamma matrix a gamma are matrices, so they must acting on some column thing, have some components. So this is just a matrix multiplication with the index suppressed. But here is a question. Why do I think a Psi prime is actually a linear combination of Psi? What makes me be able to do that? Why it's definitely linear combination? No. Well. Is it because the derivative? Yeah, exactly. The Lorentz transformation is linear. The equation is linear, so that the psi will also transform linearly, and everything could be. Linear is good. Linear means we can use linear algebra. OK, so we realize, so what exactly do I mean by covariance of the Dirac equation? It means in one frame, I have a Dirac equation. In another frame, I'd better also have a Dirac equation, right? So let's write out, spell out, what do we mean by that? Is that in one frame, I have this in the second frame. I should still have a Dirac equation. That, that's what we call this Dirac equation is covariant. Changing frame, well, if it would be a disaster if a equation, you know, holding one frame doesn't hold in the other. 
Okay, so we're just going to do that and try to figure out how, what does this transformation that it depends on the Lorentz transformation look like. So I should write here, <coughs> says x prime mu is equals to lambda mu nu x nu. Okay, so this is old frame, new frame. And I can write the inverse of that relationship because if it's a good transformation from between frames, you better be able to invert it because the inverting a frame is very easy. Okay, now we're just going to plug it in. What I get is I gamma mu, and now we'll use the chain rule And then I'll just plug in what's the inverse relationship. And now I can compare. Oh, it's even on the same level. So there's an inverse relationship, plug in, and use chain rule on the derivative, and we have S lambda. So I wrote that just because that will immediately make the math term look exactly the same. And now I just need to make the term in the middle look the same. Are we so sure that gamma matrices are not frame dependent? Oh, that's a good question. Well, we are po postulating as some <coughs> them as some linear coefficients of a equation. So but the equation would still be linear if those gammas depended on x. x sure. The Lorentz transformation does not depend on. Right, so, so gamma matrices are a bunch of matrices with numbers that do not transform under Lorentz and doesn't have dependence on x. I know that from yeah. usual, but I'm yeah. asking you using this approach, where do we see that? When you square that, you took the derivative, you took gamma out of the derivative to get the Klein-Gordon equation, right? Yeah, okay. So you basically assume that it's mm -hmm. Great point. So we already assumed that they are numbers. Great, thank you. Okay. Is everyone following? I'm just doing very silly things <laughs> such as bring down the new index. But every, everybody is following here is that we realize this transformation needs to satisfy this equation to make Dirac equation covariant. To covariant. And uh, how do I solve this? How do we solve anything? What's our favorite thing, method of solving anything? If we can't solve it for any situation, we, there's a joke I missed. <laughs> okay, if we can't solve something for a large region, what do we do? What do we always do? Taylor. Mm, exactly, Taylor. 
So we're just going to tailor this whole thing. So this is the long calculation I promised before the break, and now everybody is refreshed by coffee, tea, or any other methods. <laughs> okay, we're going to do this. So let's do the first, this thing, this thing is simpler. Okay, I'll just ask you guys that if I tailor, if I expand my Lorentz <laughs> transformation with some infinitesimal parameters, how many do you think there are? Well, let me be correct and write the first part. Yeah? If I expand my Lorentz transformation at an infinitesimal distance from identity, how many parameters there are? Six. Yeah, I read all your assignments. You guys all tell, most of you guys tell me six. So there are six of them. Okay. Why is this eta not the identity? <coughs> Why is this eta not the identity? It's, it's the identity? Yep. Sorry. It's the identity because your lambda should have one upper, one lower index. Ah, and then I lower it, it'll become eta. Sorry. Yep. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was identity before. All right, yeah, sorry. So there should be this identity part, and I decide to lower one for interesting reasons. So what do you think of the symmetry <coughs> property of this? There are six of them, clue. Clue is there are six of them, because you know there are six generators, so there must be six parameters. Yeah? It's See? symmetric and it doesn't have any trace. Is it symmetric? It can be symmetric. If it's symmetric, it has 10. Yeah. So this thing must be anti-symmetric. OK. Yeah. I'm just using like silly arithmetic identity, or well, very important arithmetic identity to say this thing must be anti-symmetric. Of course, this is a little fishy, but uh, you can show that. So this is what we mean by expanding a Lorentz transformation infinitesimally. And then you can write down the x beside upper mu part and using the following cute rule that uh, Lorentz transformation is a transformation that preserves the lens. So if you write down the upper one, Okay, let's just do it. It takes one line. Okay, this is the upper one. And then now I want to dot product together. The first term vanish. The second term is <coughs> eta mu nu x nu x mu plus x mu rho x rho x mu. And I can switch this. You realize this two term is exactly the same, which means this term is zero. Since it's symmetric here, it better be anti-symmetric there. Okay. So we realize there are six parameters. They are anti-symmetric two index things. Of course, you ask me, why don't we just label them epsilon one, two, three, four, five, six? It's more symmetric this way, and there might be other merits. Okay, excellent. We have six parameters, and you guys also have done the homework on how to relate a group element such like this guy into exponential of its generator, and who I have no idea what other generators are. But uh, I can always write it this way. Yeah? True? And we all know how to expand this guy. Huh? All right. Now we're going to do the long calculation of the day, which is plug in that expansion into that equation and say where we are.
Ready? Okay, it's not that bad. It's only three terms. And we're doing linear expansion. Okay, let me change some labels. As a euro, the first term will just give you the right hand side. The beauty of, yeah? Are we missing an i in the exponent? Very good question. That's when you learned about the unitary transform representation. And uh, the problem is we're doing a Lorentz group. Oh. And it is non compact. So it doesn't exist a unitary representation. Well, it doesn't exist a finite dimensional. Actually, this is a very good question. Because we're going to see at the end of the lecture that it's indeed not a unitary. I, well, I know that it's not, but people really <laughs> still put I and then just comment that some generators are not Hermitian because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's different a convention. You move I here, then when you solve S mu nu, then you have an I there, right? <laughs> You're just moving I around. And I decide to do it this way, just S mu nu look a little. Yeah, it's a, S mu nu look a little prettier. Not too much prettier. Yep, yeah. it's, it's just, it, that, that is pure convention. I actually have to check through all the conventions because I was following many textbooks. <laughs> okay, so it's not that bad. You take all the one term, you get the right-hand side, and the first term give you, well, this, because the rest are all one, and there is this term. That term just give you gamma nu, epsilon, new mu, and the last term is one half, gamma nu, epsilon. So, that's it, right? Linear expansion, you only take one linear expansion, the rest you just take one. Okay, so, The thing I'm going to do is in order to get rid of it, this thing, I'm going to replace this by that. Yeah? It's just this equals this. Okay. Now, we're almost done. <laughs> I can also replace this mu by beta, yeah? Last thing, sorry, is that this is the anti-symmetric, so add a better anti-symmetric this part. So this is the middle term. Okay, now I can throw away all the one halves. I get one half, so now they all have a term like that. We can throw the infinitesimal <coughs> parameter away. And what I left, those are the two terms, and I can move that guy to the right. And this is the commutator. And the other side, there's nothing I can do about it. I'll just write it down. Hey, so one, two, okay. Around the second, the third, okay, about four lines, maybe five, okay. The idea is we can use this infinitesimal method to 
change the equation imposed on all the group elements of this representation on the generators. So we realize that in order for the Dirac equation to be covariant, they had a better transform in a way with the generator satisfy equation like this for the gamma matrices. OK, so here we go. We're going to stop doing long calculation and just guess. What's the sym symmetry property of an S alpha beta? They are anti-symmetric. And uh, apparently, they have something to do with gamma matrices. So if you just want to guess what it, the answer should be. Question. Commutator. Commutator. Excellent. I'm just going to guess the answer is a commutator. And then you will spend another about three lines of calculation to figure out this is a quarter. Not a quarter is actually important. So now we can finally answer the question, what is a spinner? Well, a spinner is a solution of the Dirac equation. It a transform, and the under Lorentz transformation, a transform with this S lambda thing. And the generator of S lambda is the, a quarter of the commutator of gamma matrices. So now you know, if I ask you in the interview, what is a spinner? That's the complete answer. I might ask a follow-up question. OK. So by the way, you were like, what the hell do you mean? Like, how can I make any sense of this? What do you mean that the Psi transform in this way? A it seems something crazily complicated, and how do I have gained any intuition on them? Well, we don't have spinners. Like, you know, well, I guess we do. But uh, we will try to gain some in intuition on it and uh, try, try to understand what is S doing on our Psi. OK, so to do that, we have to make an analogy with something we do understand, which is the ordinary Lorentz for transformation. That we understand to the bones. Except we never try to understand it in the current way, this fancy generator thing. But come on, Lorentz transformation acting on a vector. Presumably, I can do the same thing. I can write it as e to the 1 half epsilon mu nu uh, No, sorry, wrong, wrong letter. Alpha, M, alpha, and the mu nu. So these are just generators for the vector representation. OK. I can clearly do that. And then, what are these M things? Well, for this, I'll write them all downstairs because alpha beta, what's the symmetric property of alpha beta? It's contracted with epsilon alpha beta. So it better be anisymmetric. And if I just take one component of epsilon, say, 1, 2, then this M1, 2 thing is an infinitesimal expansion of the Lorentz transformation. So it better be anti-symmetric too by the same argument there. So this is a subject that is anti-symmetric under alpha beta, anti-symmetric under mu nu. And this time, we don't have gamma matrices. We're talking about vectors. We don't even know about a gamma matrix. The only thing we have is metric. You probably have seen this trick in relativity. We're just going to guess. And then write down something contain two metrics, so four indices that has the symmetric property 
that we just said. And there's only one such thing. And again, you can figure out the proportional constant. This step happened to be one to satisfy the true Lorenz algebra. What this thing do? And uh, I'm not going to try to show this thing satisfy the Lorenz algebra. So just completely due to symmetric sy symmetry, this thing is fixed. And it it's this. OK. So now come to the question I asked about uh, the xy plane rotation. So what we know is that this is how a vector transform under the x plane, x y plane rotation, since there nothing happens in the other two direction, I'll just write a two by two matrix. Since we're going to compare this infinitesimally, so let's do that. OK, now I just need to compare with this guy. Which means I need to read the index. Okay. This guy, the index is raised. So this index is raised. This index is raised. Okay. I want, so the same argument, the epsilon 2, 1, m2, 1 is the same as epsilon 1, 2, m1, 2. So that one half is there to cancel that effect. So what I only need to calculate is epsilon 1, 2, m1, 2. So m1, 2 obviously doesn't have any components in the 0 and the 3 component. So if this is 1, this is 2, clearly the component not vanishing is 1 mu x1 nu equals 2, or the other way around. So this will give me a minus 1, and the other one will give me a 1. OK, so I conclude that epsilon 1, 2 is theta. So what happens at the theta equals 2 pi? By this new formulation, I get e to the 1 half, well, 1 half is canceled, so e to the this matrix minus 2 pi, no, there's no 1, just 0, OK? So guess what is this result? What's the exponential of this matrix? You can use Mathematica. Oh, didn't ask you to bring it mathematically. You can also actually exponential this matrix by do the Taylor expansion and the calculate. OK, we also have no time to do that. But it's a rotation around 2 pi. So guess the result is? Yeah? The, the identity. OK, if you calculate this matrix multiplication, it will give you identity. Just put it in mathematics. It will give you. I also tried the Taylor expansion thing. It works. It tells us the Taylor expansion of sine theta works with radius of convergence infinity. <laughs> so this thing works. OK. OK, this is very good. XY plane rotation using the same formalism. That means it, uh, a vector, if you rotate 2 pi, it will come back to itself. Such great accomplishment. Now let's look at what happens with the spinner. And here's the time I can't delay further to introduce the sum representation of gamma matrices. 
because I can't do any calculation if I don't know, well, because I'm specifically looking for S12 to be, com to be able to compare with this one. So let's see. One representation is given called the well chiral base. The name of the chiral, we, we will have emphasized on that, a lot of them later, is given by, so these are all two by two things. So the idea is we first try dimension two, dim two by two matrices, and we find three. The poly matrices are nicely anti-commute with each other. A square to minus one is awesome. If I just have, can find a fourth matrix, well, I'm all done. But you can't find any matrix anti-commute with all of them. So bummer. I have to move on. And if you read the appendix, which tells you why that a certain gamma matrices exist in certain dimension, it turns out that if you want four gamma matrices, you have to be in four dimension representation. You probably can go higher, but this is the lowest that you can go. Okay, so this is just one representation. And uh, of course, there, there is a theorem that says all the representation of the gamma matrices are equivalent. And there is actually, you can go for one of a reference to tell you specifically how to construct the matrix, the, sim the matrix to bring them into each other with a similar transformation. So if you write on one, all the rest are equivalent to this one. But uh, we'll, we'll stick with this one. And the reason for why this one is nice in a lot of ways, we'll see in the next lecture. Okay, but let's stick with this and calculate what's S12. So it's a quarter of the commutator of gamma 1 or gamma 2, but they are anti-commuting, so that's just mean I calculated one half the multiplication. So one half multiplied by that. If you are familiar with multiplying with this poly matrix together, you might remember that it gave you I sigma 3. Okay, so that's the result. And we know epsilon 1, 2 is theta. So it must be e to the one half is coming from here, minus i one half theta minus i sigma three. So that's a generic rotation around the z-axis for a spinner. We calculate the generator, we use the same parameter just like the Lorentz transformation, and we get that. And you're like, what is it? Well, I can't tell you what is it for all theta, but for theta equals 2 pi, what do you think it equals to? Well, we'll take a minute to calculate. This is the most important result of today's lecture, is that we figure out when psi, when we change the coordinate such that we're in a different frame such that it is rotated around the z-axis by 2 pi, how does psi transform? Yeah? Anybody has a result for me? It's minus one. It's minus one, literally minus one in all entries. It's the minus identity. Isn't it a crazy? This thing after turning to pi doesn't return to itself. It returns to negative itself. 
And remember, like, David tell you about this heuristic argument about how to determine the spin of the gravity. Something like if you rotate the 2 pi, it will be spin 1. If you return half of 2 pi, then it will be spin 2. And now apparently we need a 2 of 2 pi to return itself. So this is, OK, you might be frowning, but this is the heuristic argument to show that, OK, psi is a spin half. And some of you guys are nodding. OK, but see, this, you know, by my opinion, is a slightly sloppy argument. Because by this argument, this thing has a spin 3. See? It'll come back to itself three times in one round. Well, this is certainly not a spin 3 particle. So we'll have to wait. We'll have to wait when we quantize Dirac Lagrange, when we find our one particle state, and then we'll act the spin operator on that one particle state and read off ha, the spin is one half. But you know, this is a pretty good way we show that it rotated to pi, that it did come back to negative itself. So, well, now I'm just going to do some generalization. Well, OK. Yeah, I guess it doesn't answer Matthias' question yet, because this thing is indeed a unitary. So this is, this is indeed a unitary and its rotations. Oh, actually, no, I have a question before we move on. But I did something like sneaky. Well, it's not I'm being sneaky, but I have no choice. I choose a certain base to calculate uh, that uh, it rotate come to minus 1. But what if, all, what if I choose a different base? Would it be different? It better not to, right? Well, remember, somebody proved all the representation, representation are related by similar transformation. So if you have some similar transformation, let's just <coughs> a minus 1 times a, since it's minus identity in the middle, it will still give you minus identity. So yes, no matter which representation you are calculating, this thing will rotate back, rotate back to minus it itself after 2 pi rotation. OK, so the last thing I want to do is actually write down so I'm just doing some generalization by bringing an I in and uh, there is some theta so this is the exponent and the matrix is 2 to the i theta dot sigma, 2 to the i theta dot sigma. Basically, I say I can do the same calculation in the other two directions, too. And uh, I can just generalize my results to all rotations because they are all diagonal matrices. You can multiply them easily just by adding the exponent up. up. And as interestingly, the rotations are all unitary. And of course, you wonder about the boost, but then we'll come back to it tomorrow. To summarize, Psi is a spinner that would spin one half. Mm, and I think that's a good point to stop. <laughs>